Last Sunday, we talked about the resurrection plus the death of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to basically continue along that line as we are uh, looking at a resurrected life. That is the title of the message. Uh, we are going to be looking at a couple passages of Scripture in just a moment. But I want you to think with me just for a moment. What is the most important day of your life? Now let me go ahead and give you what some people would respond and say these are things that are really important in my life or uh, possibly you would even respond and say they're important in your life. Some individuals would say the day that I was born was the most important day of my life. Got it? The day that, you, I mean, if he wasn't born, what, was, what would any of this matter? So some individuals would just chime in and they would say, well, it's got to be the day that I was born. Or other individuals would be even to the category of saying, the, the greatest day in my life, the most important day, was the day that I finally finished school. Amen? You remember that? Boy, I was, I was glad to finish high school, and I was glad to finish college, and uh, I'm just glad to have all those years behind me, and I longed and looked forward to that. So some people would fall into that category, or others might even fall into the category of saying, the most important day of, the, of my life is the day that I got married. Well, that must not be that well, you know. But, but that's an important day, the day that you got married. How about this one? Uh, some individuals would respond and say, the most important day of my life is the day that I finally paid off all of my debts. Some of you are still working on that, right? Some of you pay them off and then you renew them and get more debt. That's a typical response. Uh, a lot of people have that problem of that. Or even uh, individuals might even say, the most important day of the, uh, my life is the day that I finally retired from work. <laughs> you don't retire from work, you just change jobs, okay? You, you end up going from uh, what you've been doing most of your life, and now you're doing things that you put off the most of your life in that retirement stage. Uh, Miss Sandy has been trying to get me to retire and uh, I'm, I'm fighting as hard as I can not to retire because I, I enjoy what I do in the area. Not the area of retiring from the ministry or the church, but in the area of the secular work that I do. Well, these are important. And I, I'm not here to say they're not important in your life. But one of the most important things in your life is your relationship with Christ. And that is the most important day of your life. I vividly recall the day that I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I vividly recall the day that I surrendered uh, into the area to, to the ministry. I, I, I can see and I know exactly where I was and what I was doing. Uh, so I can I look at that and uh, it, it has that sense of bringing me back to the importance of the resurrection. Because the resurrection allows us to experience a life-changing event that not only benefits you now, amen, I've been, been benefited because of the resurrected life, but it benefits me forever. From the day that I received Jesus Christ, from the day that I asked Christ to come into my life and to forgive me, from that day forward, forever and forever, I have been resurrected. And so I'm going to ask you, are you living the resurrected life? As an individual here today, individual who hears the message that is presented, are you living a resurrected life? Is your life showing the signs that your life is resurrected? That is, the resurrection is all about death being turned into life. So this is what we're going to begin to see. And I want you, I've got a passage of scripture we're going to come to, but I'm going to throw in another one right now. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at that in just a moment, verses 1 through 14. So uh, that is something you can go ahead and turn to. But while you're there, you don't have to turn far back, but you can turn back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Now, uh, verses 1 through 9 begins to give us about a resurrected life, a new life. And we're going to talk about this in just a moment. But if you haven't experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is what it's about. This is a good test. 
You can look at the life of individuals who attend church, who say they are believers in Jesus Christ, and you can actually look at them and, and compare what the Bible is saying to their lifestyle. Doesn't mean they're always perfect, but it means that something has happened in their life. So listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, all the way down to verse 9 says. It says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses in sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But look at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when we begin to look at the Word of God, it establishes to us that there is something that has happened, something that has changed in our lives. We have met the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary for us. So how do we, as individuals, how do we receive the, receive the resurrected life? How is it possible for us as individuals to receive it? So how do we receive it? First and foremost, as it is stated here, uh, basically it is not by works. Look at verse 9. The last verse that we read there, it says, establishes to us, uh, not of works lest any man should boast. Are people proud of the work that they do? Yes, they are. Many individuals will actually sign their name. You look at some of the artistic uh, uh, pictures that are painted and all. People will sign their name to it because they're proud of what they have done. Even individuals who do good deeds are individuals who want people to know uh, what they have done. They look as if they can somehow buy their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the Bible just point blank says that you do not receive the resurrected life based upon your works. It is not by what you have done. Get that out of your mind. Help people to understand that them working for their salvation is not going to get them saved. Salvation is not based upon that. So we also begin to realize that uh, we don't receive it because of our works. It is something we also need to re remember and understand. We don't receive it based upon our physical birth. By that, what do I mean by the physical birth? I've heard individuals say, and if you ask them, are you saved? And they will somehow inadvertently say, well, my grandparents were faithful members down at the church and my parents were faithful members at, at a church. Therefore, I've got to be okay. Well, it is not by physical birth. It doesn't matter who were your parents. The basis of your resurrected life, the salvation that comes into our life, is based upon your personal decision to accept or to reject Jesus Christ. So it is not, you cannot say, well, my dad was, my aunt was, my, you know, it has nothing to do with somebody else. It is an individual acceptance of Jesus Christ. So how do we receive it? It is on an individual basis. We began to realize that. And then you also have individuals basically who come into the category that say, well, we, we, you know, we receive it because we're very religious. You know, there's gonna, one of the things that Satan does not stop is the promotion of religion. He likes the promotion of religion. He has no problem with religious individuals. He wishes basically, I will say, he wishes that all individuals were somehow religious because they would get caught up in the religion and they would leave out God. 
We would be so wrapped up into what our church is doing and what our group is doing that somehow we miss the true meaning of having that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So basically, we do not receive it through being a religious group. Well, this certain group's going to go to heaven. All other groups are not going to go to heaven. Uh, you heard individuals who say that. Only our church is going to get to heaven. Thank God that's not the truth. Believers in Christ are the ones who will make it into heaven. So we also can begin to realize, according to what Ephesians chapter 2 is establishing here, we look down in verse 8 and it establishes and it says that you and I, we receive it, it's by faith in Jesus Christ. Now wait a minute. Some of you say, well, I've got more faith than somebody else has got. Well, look at what the passage actually says because it establishes something very fundamental to us, that it is faith, but where did you get the faith? We get it from God. Now listen to what it says here. It establishes and it says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So we begin to establish and realize that we receive the resurrected life because of the grace that God has for us. And it establishes our relationship with Him. And what we can sum in this area of how do we receive it, it's not what you do in you that saves you, but what Christ does in you. When Christ does something in you, you experience the resurrection. So what is a resurrected life? What can we really focus upon and begin to understand a resurrected life is? You should be able to look at people and you should be able to see by their actions, by their words, by the things they do, the things they don't do, you should be able to see and know without a shadow of a doubt that they have been resurrected. I'm dead to the old life. Let's turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3, which is the uh, one that was on our uh, uh, main points. Colossians chapter 3, and go with me to verse 1. Actually, it goes from verse 1, and it goes pretty much this whole chapter. And if you will follow along with me, verse 1. So the resurrected life, verse 1. Now, King James I like what it does here. Because according to the author here, he gives us an understanding and he makes it aware that not every individual is resurrected. Not every individual has the resurrection of their old life and now having the new life. Because it uses one word, if, if. And I put mine, I've underlined mine to where it reminds me that this is not, everybody who's religious is not born again. Everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ may not be a follower of Jesus Christ. I have individuals ask me sometimes at, at funeral services or when their loved one dies, do, do you know if they're, they're in heaven and all and all these different things, questions that they ask? And the reality is the only person I can tell you who is, who is uh, surrendered to Jesus Christ is who? Myself. But I can say this to them from uh, according to scriptures, the way that they have lived their life is a testimony that something happened deep inside many years ago. Well, let's look at what happens here. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 1, it says, If... If you have been risen with Christ, if you are alive, that's the resurrection. If you're risen with Christ, if, you, if you've come uh, uh, away from uh, what you once were and now you're risen with Christ, if you're dead to the old self and alive with the new self, you begin to see some of the things that happens. So if is uh, uh, just drawn into that uh, verse 1 here, and it establishes to us what the resurrected life is. Is it something that is different than your past? You need to know that. So it is a new life. Jot that down. It is a new life. I have a new life. You should be able to tell me the difference in your life the day that you received Jesus Christ and the difference in your life before you received Jesus Christ. Do you know the difference in your life? What is the difference in your life? Is there a difference? Can people really see a difference in your life? Is there a new life in you? People say, yeah, I'm saved. 
Well, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing the same old stuff I've always done. Well, there's something wrong with somebody who is saying that they're a child of God and they're living like the devil. I'm waiting. Amen. You got that? You, you cannot do that. You cannot say that I, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, and live like the devil. Last week I said, and, and just to send it out the clip, you know, the devil's lost, he's a loser. I mean, one of the greatest things is that he has lost. And, and, you know, by him losing makes Jesus the winner. And so your life, you have a new life. It is a different life. I can tell you the difference that Christ has made in my life. And I, more importantly, I, I want people to see the difference that Christ has made in my life. I want them to know I don't do the things that I once did. Those who knew me back then, every one of them cannot point to me and say, that's the same person. Because something has changed in my life. I am no longer that sinful individual as we just saw and as we read there in Ephesians. You know, something's happened to us. But let's go on here in Colossians. He says, if you're risen with Christ, you need to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now, people, let me tell you something. We all have the same amount of time in 24 hours. And I guarantee whatever you are able to accomplish during the day, your affection is set on. You want to get it accomplished and you get it accomplished. Well, this is what Scripture is saying to us is that we need to set our affection. We need to put our affection upon things that are above, not on things on the earth. So what is most important to you? Is it the heavenly things that really will last for all eternity or is it the earthly things? Set your affections upon the things above. Set your desires upon those things above. And when we begin to see here, he says, um, and, and, and secondly, in the area of what is the resurrected life, it is an empowered life. It is a life that has power. People often say, and they somehow, they short the ability that God has. They say, oh, I, I, I've tried to overcome this sin in my life, and I can't overcome this sin in my life. I prayed and asked God to remove it from me, but it just somehow just creeps back into my life. You know why it creeps back in your life? Because you really haven't dealt with it. Because God, listen, God is more powerful than any sin that you have in your life. There is nothing that you cannot walk away from with the power of God. He empowers us. He places within us the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's what he says. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then you shall also appear with him in glory. Something's happened. I'm empowered. I'm not the same old me. I'm the new me in Jesus Christ. He takes away the past. Look what he says. He establishes here uh, for us as individuals. He says in verse 5, Mortify, therefore, your members. You know what you haven't done? You haven't said, Okay, Lord, here's the sin that keeps coming into my life. It's a sin of, of, of my eyes seeing things that they ought not see or my mouth saying things that they ought not, uh, ought not to be repeated or said. And what we have to do is we have to take those objects from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet and we have to t uh, totally surrender it to Jesus Christ. Lord, here is my mouth. Help me to bite my tongue before I say something I shouldn't say. Lord, here is my eyes. Help me to turn away from the evil. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, what it says, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of, of disobedience. So I mean, basically he's saying, we've got to have this new life. We've got to have a life that's different. And he says in verse seven, in the woods you also walk sometime when you lived in them. You're new. You're no longer walking that way. You're no longer of, of allowing it to have control of your life. You give it control. The sin you're giving control in your life. Now, 
When you're given sin control and you are saying that, well, I, you know, that I just can't help myself. I, I, you know, just overlook my sin. Now, what you are doing is you're shortchanging the power of God. We see Jesus Christ going in his ministry and what Christ did is he performed miracles. And he did it in such a way that others looked at him and marveled. Well, look at verse 8. He says, but now also you put off all these anger. I mean, you know, you, you look at verse 5 and you say, well, I'm not involved in any of those things, so I'm okay. But when you get to verse 8, you begin to say, all right, time to sing, time to, you know, have the altar call. We'll go, you know, throw our motions, and then we're going to go to our homes. But what Paul does is he writes and he says, put off all of these. Anger, malice, blasphemy. Filthy communication. Lying, verse 9, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Put on the new man, establishes that. So let's go ahead in the area of what is the resurrection life. A resurrected life is not only a new life, it is not only an empowered life, but it is a life that is forgiven and forgiving. It's a forgiving life. The more I look at how much Jesus Christ forgave me, the more willing I am to forgive others. You got it? The reason you can't forgive others is because you're shortchanging and you're not realizing all that God has forgiven you of. God has forgiven me of past, present, and future sins. He cleanses us. If we go over to 1 John, He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. I'm new. I, I'm not a sinner any longer because God does not look at me through, through, or throughout looking through the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us of all our sins. And I am forgiven and therefore, because I have been forgiven, it makes it easy to forgive others. Have you really looked at your life? I mean, really looked at your life and found out just how bad a person you were. Well, the Bible says, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. So we begin to understand, I am a sinner deserving death. Well, you know, other people do us wrong. I mean, you know, you begin to see, you, you get the picture that we have been forgiven and we are to forgive. That is what a resurrected life is. You'll see an individual who can come to the point of saying to the person who murdered their own child uh, and say to that person who shot and killed them, say, I forgive you. How can they do that? Because they've been forgiven themselves and they realize Next, in the area of what is a resurrected life, it is a life that is following Jesus Christ. Following Christ, we begin to see this, and we begin to see in verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. He begins to establish, we're not to look at the, the, the situation as status quo, as looking at different types of individuals. He says that in verse 11 where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And so he is establishing to us is that our life is to be different. We are to be following after Jesus Christ. We are to be different. He says in verse, uh, verse 12 here, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, of mind, meekness, and long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Uh, if any man have a quarrel, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. So we begin to follow Jesus Christ. It is the resurrected life is a life that is following Christ. When you see somebody do that, you're like, you're shocked. You're saying, how can they do it? It's because they're following Jesus Christ. And a resurrected life will follow Jesus Christ. And it is also uh, the resurrected life. It is a life that will never experience the ultimate wrath of God. Oh, that's great. You know, we experience wrath. We have difficulties. We have hardships. We have suffering. We have pain. When you follow Jesus Christ, Christ does not remove you from all those. But he does, listen to me, he does, according to the word of God, he, he keeps us and he spares us from the ultimate wrath of God. You know what the ultimate wrath of God is? Read the book of Revelation. 
It is the outpouring of the wrath of God. It is the vials that are opened. It is the horsemen that come. And you begin to see this and you understand what Christ has done for you is that he is going to, you know, he is, he is going to keep you from experiencing that. So it's a life that will never, I, I don't worry about it because Jesus has paid my price. I'm resurrected. I don't have to fear that because of what Christ did. Next, it is a life that acknowledges our past and blames no one else for it. And I want to just take a moment on that, not long, but I want you to realize an individual who has the resurrected life finds that nobody is to blame for what they have become except themselves. They look at their life, they acknowledge, my past has brought me here. Nobody, nobody has forced me and nobody can force us to do things that we are not willing to give into. We give into it. And so it's a life that acknowledges our past. We look at, I, I look at Paul, and here's Paul. It was pointed out in his later life about you know, the, the type of person he was. He was a persecutor of Christians. And it was pointed out to him, and he says, You, you guys are right. I was, I was a pers I was a persecutor of Christians. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ saved me. And his life was changed. You see, he didn't say, well, I, I, I'm going to blame the, the, the religious people. I'm going to blame the Pharisees because they brought me up that I needed to go out and persecute all these Christians and put them to death. I had orders from them to do this. But he says, I am a sinner. I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. That's what Paul's writing, and he's telling us here. And finally, a resurrected life is a fruitful life. You go over to Galatians, and you begin to see that, that the fruit of the Spirit is all these different things. It is a new life, a resurrected life. People ought to be able to look at you and say, there goes a resurrected individual. Well, let me ask you this. Who can be resurrected? Well, the answer to that is very obviously anybody can be resurrected. Anybody can be resurrected. By that, anybody, we need to realize, I mean, just anybody. And you can jot down these very quickly. You, we could talk about the poor, the rich, the tall, the short, the good, the bad. Okay, and I thought about, well, if I'm going to go ahead and throw out all those things, I need to kind of give you a little bit of an illustration of those. We could talk about the poor person can be resurrected. We look at the widow's might that Jesus Christ looked at, and he says, she gave more than all those who gave an abundance more in dollar signs. So a poor person can be resurrected. We could talk about rich individuals. Well, you know, there's several individuals I could talk about as rich. We could talk about Matthew, the, the tax collector that became a part of the disciples of Jesus Christ. But I thought, well, let's go back to the Old Testament and let's talk about Abraham. Abraham was a very rich individual. And Abraham was chosen by God, and he followed God. He was obedient to God. So we can actually say that, well, in the Bible, there are poor people, there are rich people who have that opportunity to, be, to have the relationship with Jesus Christ and God above. Well, we talk about tall people. Anybody know of a tall person in the Bible who was saved? Well, if you don't, here you go. King Saul, the first king. One of the things that was uh, attributed to him is that he stood taller than the rest of the individuals. And he was chosen by God to be the very first king. So here is a tall individual. I mean, you can go and you can add more to that. Well, what about a short individual? Can you think of a short individual that actually one day climbed up into a tree? Ah, you all knew that when you was ready for that one. Zacchaeus, we know that here, here's something happened in the life of Zacchaeus. When Jesus came and, and, and presented himself to Zacchaeus, there was something that changed in his life, that he had a resurrected life. And he says, Lord, if I've, if I've swindled anybody, I'm going to give them back more than I took from them. What a good man. Well, we could talk about what good man. Let's talk about a good person. Well, one of the first persons that come to my mind is over in, in, in John chapter 3. I thought about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good person. Nicodemus was an individual who was obeying the, the Levitical law. He was very devout. He was very devoted. He come to Jesus in secret. And, and we see that Nicodemus is a good individual. What about a bad individual? Can you think of some bad people? No, I'm not asking you to identify yourself. But a bad person in the Bible I thought about is just Paul. Paul was bad. 
Well, that being said, you get the picture there, that there are a lot of people, and so basically, who can be resurrected? Anybody. You can experience the resurrected life. Well, let's talk about the reality. The reality of this is basically Christ died and rose again for all people. That's the reality. Both Ephesians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 3, are talking about what Christ did. He did for you, for me, for us, what we could not do ourselves. And if we look at that concept of what Christ did, is He did it that we might obtain salvation, newness, something different. And in, in there in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then verse 70, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You see, Christ died and He rose again for you. But here's the reality not everybody will live for Him. Everybody will not live for Him. People are so prone to say they want Jesus Christ, but they're not willing to surrender their lives. You cannot have a resurrected life unless you're dead to the old life. Amen? You got that? Jesus could never have been resurrected had He not died. He had to die. So He is the illustration that through the death that you and I, if we die to the old self, we can be alive in the new self. You can't just, well, I, I just want this little part of me to die. No, it's all of you dying. Because when all of us dies, then we all can be resurrected with Jesus Christ. And you can live your life without Jesus where you have no certainty of your eternity, or you can start today putting your trust in the one who died and rose from the grave. And he did that to offer us the opportunity to live that resurrected life. Can you really see a difference in your life since you've received Christ? New life, something new. And I'm here to tell you, it gets new each day. It's not something old that you're dragging along with you. Christ keeps renewing us and giving us the power to purge out the things in our life that ought not be there. He just somehow, He reveals it to us and we deal with it. Because if we're risen with Christ, we want to seek those things which are above. We don't want to put our eyes upon the earth. So I ask, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? That's the basis. What you do with Jesus Christ. What I did with Jesus Christ does not benefit you other than me being a testimony to you. It's what you do with Jesus Christ. Are you going to turn Him away? Push Him away? Are you going to ignore Him? Are you finally going to say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I'm dead to the old life and I'm alive with the new life. Bow with me in prayer. Father, we pray that our life would be new in Jesus Christ. And that people would see us wherever we are, whatever we're doing. They would see that we're acting differently than the norm. Father, if ever we needed men and women, young and old, to step up and be what you'd have them to be, it is in our generation today. More people are turning away from the church and from Jesus Christ. 
They're turning to the things of their own evil desires. And we need, we need men and women who will step up and say, I will follow Jesus Christ. I will live that resurrected life, that new life that comes through Jesus Christ. This is my prayer. May we respond accordingly. In Christ's name, amen.